Unfortunately, many of those snakes are the golden lance head, one of the deadliest in the world. 90% of the people who die from snake bite in Brazil, it's the golden lance head. You know, there's another serpent that's rampaging through this world, and the only anti-venom is the blood of Jesus. We're going to talk about that tonight. Welcome to Revelation Now. <laughs> Good evening, friends. Welcome again to Revelation Now. Everything is about to change. We'd like to welcome all of those joining us across the United States, North America, and literally around the world, part of our extended Bible study class. Tonight we have a very important topic. It's entitled, Did God Create a Devil? And we're going to look into what the Bible has to say about that subject. Now, before we get to our presentation, just a reminder, we are translating this program live into Spanish. And if you'd like to get the Spanish translation, just go to the Amazing Facts uh, Spanish uh, website. You can also see it at AF or Amazing Facts Latino Facebook and YouTube channel. We also have sign language for those who are deaf, and that is at the Revelation Now website. So be sure to take a look at that. Now, at the end of the presentation this evening, we'll be taking some of your Bible questions. So if you have a Bible-related question, you can just type it in the comment section on Facebook, and we'll try to get to as many of those questions as possible. We'd also like to just mention a few of the countries that are viewing this program. We've gotten some feedback from several countries. These are not all of them, but we have folks watching in Ireland and Denmark, Australia, South Africa, Sweden, the UK, Netherlands, India... Trinidad and Tobago, Italy, Spain, all over Central America, Chile, Argentina, and of course across the United States and Canada, and many other places that I have not mentioned. And so this is really a global Bible study. And uh, if you would like to interact with us, we would love to uh, get a picture of your group. Maybe you're meeting in a home, maybe in a church, and uh, you send that to us. Just go to the Revelation Now website, and you can... Uh, Click on the link that says contact us and send us a picture of your group and we might be able to put that up on the screen. Tonight, we're going to show you a picture of a group meeting in Richmond, Virginia. And we'd like to greet all of those out there who are joining, watching on the big screen. And again, if you'd like to send us a picture of your group, you are welcome to do that. Now, as mentioned earlier, the topic tonight is Did God Create a Devil? And we do have a free offer that goes along with our presentation by the same name, Did God Create a Devil? This is our free offer, and we'll be happy to send this to anyone here in North America. It's a digital download. All you have to do is text the word DEVIL to the number 40544, and you'll be able to get a digital copy. If you're outside of North America, just go to the Revelation Now website, and you can click on the free offers, and you'll be able to download. It's one of our Amazing Facts study guide part of the series. The supplemental lesson is entitled uh, The Prince of Pride, and this is also available for free at the Revelation Now website. Uh, Pastor Doug will use some of the questions in the lesson, but he does not follow it question by question. It's really supplemental, and so after the presentation, we want to encourage you to read through the lesson, fill in the answers, look up the verses in the Bible, and that will enrich your study in God's Word. Well, at this time, I'd like to invite Pastor Doug to come forward, and uh, we're going to get ready for our presentation this evening. Good evening, Pastor Doug. Good evening, Pastor Ross. Well, it's a little windy today, Pastor Doug, in Northern California. Yeah, I understand that your house is in the dark. It is. <laughs> we lost power about an hour before we went live, and I was a little concerned about here in, you know, the Roseville, Granite Bay area if we can have power, but the lights are on, so Amen. we've got power. Keep praying, friends. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, Pastor Doug, our topic is an important one. Did God create a devil? And before we get to that, let's start with prayer. Mm -hmm. Dear Father, once again, we are so grateful for this opportunity to just gather together and open up your word and study. We thank you that we're able to participate in a worldwide Bible study. Now, we're talking about the devil tonight, Lord, and he's not very happy about these meetings. So we want to ask your special protection. Mm -hmm. uh, we ask that you would bless in uh, the studio here, that everything would work according to plan. Be with those who are listening, Father, and guide us into a clear understanding of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Ross. I was just thinking as he was doing the opening remarks, we've been doing these seminars together 
since 2005, 15 years now. And uh, it's been a joy to see people come to understand the Word of God because that uh, always transforms our lives. Welcome, friends. We're so glad for all of you who are watching. We know we've got uh, people all over the country. I want to greet those who are watching on 3ABN as well as AFTV, uh, Facebook, YouTube. And uh, our subject tonight, I hope you'll pray uh, as I share because uh, it, it is so important to understand this. We're really talking about a battle in spiritual places. Why is there evil in the world today? And that'll be our lesson title, Did God Create a Devil? And before we get to that, I thought, once again, we'll go visit with some of our friends who are out on the street and see what did they have to say about this subject. I don't believe that there's really a devil. I think that there's temptations in this world that go against God's uh, beliefs. I believe in spirituality, so I definitely believe that there is an evil, a darkness, but is it the devil per se? I'm not sure. If you believe in God, then you believe in the devil. He was thrown out of heaven, so I, he was a, he's a devil. I'm a Hindu. I believe there's a little bit of a devil within all of us, and it's just there to balance things out. If God only creates subservient beings, then there's no free choice and there's no actual love. God wanted to prove who he is, his love, his character, um, his nature, um, through everything. Life is a test and it's all humans are given free will to decide what route they want to go, whether it's the route of the devil or if it's the route, the route of God. I think that because it gives us as people the chance to have free will and to choose a side and not have to be forced to one side. We have the free will to choose which way you want to go. He didn't want to destroy. He was one of his main angels. He destroyed himself. Mm, some very interesting uh, responses from across the spectrum. It's interesting that some people say they believe in God, but they don't believe in a devil, uh, which leads a person to wonder, well, then what is the source for all the evil? How do we even know there is evil? How do you define what is evil except that you can contrast it by what is the ultimate standard for good. It's because most people inherently know what is good, we recognize what is evil. And so in many respects, the, uh, the evil and the wickedness in the world and people's revulsion to that, it gives us this inherent understanding that things are not meant to be this way and that there is a war between good and evil that is going on in our world. And... Uh, it's really a cosmic conflict. Now we're going to talk about if God is a loving God, why would he make a devil? Did he make a devil? If he did make a devil, if he's all powerful, why does he allow him to exist? Why doesn't God destroy him? How many people have turned away from God? They say, well, if there was a God, why would he let innocent children, they're born with deformities or illness, uh, why would he let them suffer? What have they done wrong? There's no justice in it. And if God's all-powerful, why doesn't he just destroy the devil? So we're going to do our best to answer some of these very important, age-old, monumental questions. Again, we're going to go through a question-answer format to make sure we cover all the bases. And starting with question number one, with whom and how were the, did sin originate? So uh, with whom, how, and where did sin originate? Well, we're going to go to the Bible. And this is a Revelation program, so we'll be starting in Revelation 12, verse 9. It tells us in that chapter about a war between good and evil, and it specifically mentions this dragon, who's also called the old serpent, the devil, and Satan. Right here in chapter 12 of Revelation, you've got the four main titles of the devil. There's another one that we're going to read about now, and that's found in Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12. Matter of fact, it says right there, how you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer. I think it'd be good to turn to that passage and read it. Isaiah chapter 14. And, and just to give you some background, some of these prophecies about the devil, they start out as the prophet is talking to a king or a kingdom, and then the prophet moves to the evil power that is behind the king. Here it's talking about a message to the king of Babylon. And he finally says in verse 12, Isaiah 14, how you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground who weaken the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. 
I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Yet you will be brought down to Sheol, to the lowest depths of the pit. And you can see right away that uh, Lucifer had what you would call eye problems. He kept saying, I, 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 I. I might pause here and just mention that uh, God is defined by the word love. If you could sum God up in one word, the Bible says God is love. By contrast, the devil is selfishness. He is all about himself. I've heard it said from those who work with uh, people in uh, mental institutions that folks that are struggling with mental illness often use the words I, me, my, mine, and myself five times more than people that would be considered mentally balanced or healthy. Sin is a form of selfishness, and selfishness is sin, and it is really a form of insanity. When you think about it, the idea that the creature, now Lucifer was created, could rebel against the creator is insanity in itself. Now, there's another passage I want to take you to, and maybe I'll, I'll wait a moment before I go to the one there in Ezekiel. So, his name was Lucifer. Now, when God made this beautiful angel, he was the highest of the angels. He did not make a devil. He makes everything good. And the word Lucifer, it's not a bad name. I was uh, doing a meeting like this many years ago. I was in a laundromat. Uh, Karen wasn't with me. I was washing my own clothes. And, and while I was waiting for them to dry, there was a boy there, and his mother was off in the distance folding things, and he was playing with a little matchbox car on the linoleum. And so I said, so what's your name? And he didn't even look up. He said, Lucifer. <laughs> and it kind of took me by surprise. And I thought, well, I guess you folks don't go to church, do they? <laughs> but, but technically, there's nothing wrong with the name. It, it means a light bearer, and that's where we get the word luminescence and, and lucite. Um, but um, he started out good, and he went bad. We'll say a little bit more about that. Number two, so did God create a devil or a defective angel when he created Lucifer? Does God make anything bad? The Bible tells us in the book of James, chapter 1, verse 17, every good and perfect gift comes from above. Everything good comes from God. Jesus said, only God is good. And even in the beginning, when he made everything, you look at the paradise that God created, the purity, the beauty. It says God saw everything that he made, and indeed it was not only good, it was very good. And the whole terrible disaster was sin. God did not want Adam and Eve to listen to the enemy. He didn't want sin to enter this world. The whole purpose from the, for the plan of salvation is to save people from the devil and the awful consequences of sin. So um, this was never God's plan. God makes everything good. He makes everything perfect. So the next question is, yeah, and you can read here now in Ezekiel 28, it says, Thou was perfect in thy ways from the day that you were created until iniquity was found in thee. And so once again now, we're going to go to Ezekiel chapter 28, and you can start with verse 14 here. You know, if you want to remember two of these main passages about the devil, just you got Isaiah 14, you double 14, you got 28, and it's Ezekiel 28. And uh, starting here with um, verse 12, Son of man, take up this lamentation for the king of Tyre. Now he was talking to the king of Babylon, now he's talking to this proud and evil king of Tyre, king of the Phoenicians. And he says to him, Thus says the Lord God, you were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Well, that's not the king of Tyre. Nobody's been in the garden of Eden since Adam and Eve, and it wasn't the king of Tyre. He's talking about, but Lucifer was there, tempting Adam and Eve. Every precious stone was your covering. The sardis, the topaz, the diamond, the braille, the onyx, the jasper mentions many of the same stones that you would have found on the breastpiece of the high priest. It, it, Lucifer held this position of glory and honor. Also, some of these same stones are the ones you find in the foundation of the New Jerusalem in Revelation. Sapphire, turquoise, and emerald with gold, the workmanship of your timbrels and pipes. Those are words to describe voice and music. And so I'll tell you, if anyone understands the power of music, that would be the devil. You know, music is a gift from God, but the devil is good at taking every gift of God and distorting it and abusing it for his own purposes. 
The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes were prepared in you on the day you were created. Now, here's another important point. Lucifer was not born. Everybody watching now, you were all born. Adam and Eve were created. Everyone else was born. Lucifer was not born. God created the angels. Angels do not marry. Sometimes people say, well, but angels in Genesis 6, didn't they marry humans? No, they misunderstand that verse. Jesus said, angels do not marry. They do not procreate. Man was given the ability, made in the image of God, to create in his own image through children, through an act of love. I think that infuriated the devil that he could not do that. So the devil was created, not by God. He was created a beautiful angel, but he became a devil. Notice here. It says, uh, it was prepared for you in the day you were created. Verse 14, you were the anointed cherub who covers. There by the ark of God in the temple, you see there were two angels. Moses, when he built the, uh, the ark of the covenant that held the Ten Commandments, above it there were two angels. This represented the, the guardian angels, the covering cherubs by the throne of God. Talks about them in Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah is caught up into vision and he sees God on his throne and the angels on the right and the left wafting their wings and saying, holy, holy, holy. Lucifer had the highest position of any created being. He was the leader of God's heavenly host. It says, you are the anointed cherub who covers. I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. He was in the very presence of God in paradise. You walked back and forth in midst of the fiery stones, the glory of God's presence. He was there. Verse 15, and this is repeating this point. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in you. So you say, well, where did it come from? <laughs> yeah, it's like everyone's trying to figure out where did the coronavirus come from? And there's lots of theories out there. Where did AIDS come from? Where did the first bacteria or cold come from? Where did sin come from? Now, this is a very important part for us to understand, is that God makes his creatures free. And because his creatures are made free, we have free choice. Lucifer was created perfect. He was also made very beautiful and very powerful. And his beauty and his wisdom and his power, all the other angels adored him. They worshiped God, but they highly loved and respected Lucifer. And when he saw the other angels bowing in adoration to Jesus, but they did not worship him, that's when it really became a problem. Pardon me, friends. We'll have to put this on the bloopers. My microphone just came off. There we go. All right, back to the show. And so that he really resented that he did not have the worship that the angels had. And so he began to harbor these seeds of jealousy inside his heart. You might be thinking, well, Pastor Doug, that must mean that God made a defective angel. If God knows everything, and if God has all power, why didn't God just stop him from doing that? Couldn't God have made him where he didn't? Let me see if I could illustrate. And Mrs. Bachelor is going to bring me my, my smartphone, which is actually much smarter than I am. But I did learn how to uh, program my phone so it gives me what everybody is actually looking for, which is love. Everyone out there likes to be liked. I hope we all want love. And so let me see where my microphone is here. I found the answer to the world's greatest need. Oh, got to press play. Good evening, Doug. Good evening, smartphone. I want to tell you something, Doug. We're all listening. I want to tell you how much I love you. Oh. It's because you're just, well, you're so lovable. Everything about you is adorable. I know. And you're just so intelligent. You're brilliant and you're smart. And you're so good looking. It's just absolutely stunning. While you've got the strength of Samson, you've got the wisdom of Solomon, and the courage of Elijah all wrapped up in one person. Absolutely <laughs> remarkable. That's why I love you, Doug. I love you. I love you. I love you. I love you. Oh, I, I love you. Better. I love you. Roses are red and violets are blue, and I love you. I love you, Doug. I love you, Doug. We ought to make an app. Everybody's self-esteem will just go through the roof. I don't need Karen anymore now. I've got a new app. 
that'll tell me it loves me and it never says anything bad. It just says, I love you, Doug, I love you, Doug. It doesn't identify any of my faults. Why? Because I pre-programmed it to tell me what I wanted to hear. You think it really makes me feel better? No. Because it's not doing it, it's just echoing what I programmed it to say. If that really made me feel better, then there's really something wrong with my concept of love. So can God, does God have the power to pre-program all of his creatures to say, I love you, God, I love you, God, and not make any mistakes? Yes, but he does not do that. He really does create his intelligent beings with the ability to make intelligent choices so that we can choose to love him. That's why it says in the Bible, choose ye this day who you will serve. That's why Moses commands people, I command you to love the Lord. Why would you tell somebody to do something they can't do? And so we can choose to love God. And he wants us to love him because of who he is. Sin comes when we choose to love ourselves more than God. See, humans were created so that love should go out to God and to our fellow man. The disease of sin, and it started with the devil, was to turn that inner compass around so that that first love is ourselves. It's all about ourselves. And God is all about loving, and that means giving. Matter of fact, John 3, 16. God so loved the world, he did what? He gave. And so this is such an important truth for us to understand, friends, that God is a loving God. Now, if I didn't already show you that picture, <laughs> if I was going to ask you, when you close your eyes and you try and picture the devil, what do most people think of when they think of the devil? It's some character that's got... Um, He's got a pitchfork or a trident, and that's because he supposedly is in charge of hell to make sure everyone cooks evenly, and he flips them like burgers. Uh, and uh, he's got uh, bat wings, he's got a pointy tail, and he's got goat hooves, and he's got a goatee, and he wears red leotards, and he's got horns, and uh, I, I had, uh, every now and then I grow a beard, and I, I had a COVID beard for a little while that I grew, and, and people say, shave your beard, Doug. You look like a sinister minister. And it's not so bad now, but when I was younger and my hair was dark, it did look a little bit diabolical. And that's where you get that word. But the uh, Bible doesn't tell us the devil looked like that. He wants us to think he looks like that, where it's a frightening, ugly image. It's a terrifying image. It's ghoulish. He wants people. That's sort of a medieval picture of God comes from mythology. It's not in the Bible. He was a beautiful angel. And then you got the other extreme where people think the devil is a cartoon. He's a joke. And they'll even say, I got red devil paint and people are going to buy a devil's food cake. And even now some of you are being tempted by looking at that box of cake. <laughs> and they think the devil's a joke. He's not a joke. He's not ugly. He's deadly. But you know, even some serpents can be very hypnotic and very beautiful. So what finally happened? How did this all unfold? Well, you can read about it in the Bible. Uh, the devil, he caused this rebellion. He started saying, you know, he resented that God was being worshipped as supreme, that Jesus, the Son, was being worshipped as supreme. And, and uh, he thought he should be. And God said, no, that's not your purpose. That's not why you were created. The commandments say worship God only. And he began to go around among the other angels and he started launching a political campaign. And you know, one of the first casualties of any political campaign is the truth. Now, we, we see this at the time of this recording too. And then uh, he started saying, you know, God, we're angels. We don't need God telling us what to do. We've got our own intelligence to guide us and we don't need his law restricting our freedoms. We should have absolute freedom and Lucifer said, you know, if I was in charge, we'd all be a lot happier. And he began very, keep in mind, he's, he's just under God in intelligence. He was a brilliant angel. And he went around among the angels and he began to campaign to try to withdraw support. It caused great commotion in heaven until finally it all reached critical mass. And the Bible tells us there was an all-out war. And it's hard for us to comprehend how titanic that must have been that there was a war in heaven. But this is what the Bible tells us. Revelation 12, verse 7. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, 
and the dragon fought in his angels. Now someone can send in a question saying, now, who is Michael? We know, of course, the word dragon is a symbolic name for the devil. And uh, so number four, what powerful beings work under the devil's command? It tells us in Revelation 12, verse 4, his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. Well, what are those stars? You read on, it says, he, the devil, was cast into the earth and his angels were cast down with him. Now see, when the devil was evicted from heaven during this war, it's hard to comprehend what kind of weapons they use. I don't know that we understand that. Uh, the Bible says we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. Uh, devils do not use chemical warfare. They probably don't use you know, typical weapons that we think of. There are stories in the Bible where it tells us that an angel of the Lord was over Jerusalem with a drawn sword in his hand. And uh, that was really just a picture. In Ezekiel 9, it tells about an angel that had a, a destroying weapon in his hand. We don't know what it is. And uh, we did a, a movie. You can actually find it online. Amazing Facts produced something called Cosmic Conflict. And we tried to portray these angels having a war. And when we got done, we realized it looked a little like Star Wars with them using these light swords. <laughs> and it's, so it's... Uh, it's, it, we can only use our imagination, but somehow they were engaged and Satan and a third of the angels that were loyal to him, fiercely loyal, they were evicted from heaven. From that point, Lucifer then was given some freedom. Now you might say, why didn't God just destroy Lucifer? When he said, I'm rebelling against you, God could have said, all right, well, you know, I, I want to be loved, but here's one that didn't love me. And all God had to do is point his finger and lightning could have shot forth out of God's finger and he could have burnt up Lucifer right there. God could snap his fingers, blink his eyes, and immediately Lucifer would cease to exist. Why didn't he do that? Does God want us to obey him because we are afraid of him? Or does God want us to obey him because we love him? And uh, he doesn't want us to always be, you know, when you tell your children, can you clean up your room? Oh, please don't beat me. I'll clean my room. You don't want your kids to respond that way. You want them to clean the room because there's good reasons for what you're asking. In every command of God, there is a good reason for what God is asking. And he wants us to have faith in him, that he has our best interest in mind. He wants us to obey and love him willingly. Now, the Bible says that we should revere, reverence, be in awe of, calls it fearing God, respecting God. A child can love their father, crawl into the father's lap, and still be awed by the power of the father. And that's the loving relationship God wants us to have. But if God said, as soon as you disobey me, you're going to be annihilated, well, then uh, his creatures would obey. The other angels would have said, oh, Lucifer was right. We better pay attention. We better sit up and behave that's not what he wants. He doesn't want us motivated by fear. He wants joy in heaven. And you can't have that joy if every time someone thinks I might do something wrong, I might choose to make the wrong choice, lightning. You know, there is a, uh, a verse in the Bible in Ecclesiastes, and it says, Because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the hearts of the sons of men are fully set in them to do evil. And a uh, simple translation of that is, because God is patient and loving and merciful, some people become hardened in their bad behavior. And this is what happened to Lucifer. He took this uh, God's mercy as a sign of weakness. And he told the other angels, don't give up now. And God gave him some freedom, and he went throughout the universe. After he got done trying to recruit the angels, I think God has unfallen worlds. The Bible tells us that God through Christ made the worlds, plural. And Satan probably went and tried to recruit other support. And they, they were, he was given probably limited access to these other worlds, so he couldn't just harangue them. But when he came to our world, God said, the only place you can meet with these creatures made in my image is at the tree. Don't bother them any other place. And he warned Adam and Eve, be on your guard because there's an enemy and do not eat from this forbidden tree. And then we all know what happened. When man chose to listen to the devil instead of God, God said, do not eat it. The devil said, go ahead and eat it. When man chose to listen to the devil instead of God, the Bible tells us in Romans chapter 6, whoever you obey, that's whose servant you are to the one who you obey. Man surrendered dominion of this world to the devil. 
And Satan was then cast down to this world, the only place that ended up listening to his taunts against God. And he's used this as a staging ground to continue his battle against God since that time 6,000 years ago. That's why even Jesus acknowledged that the devil was the prince of this world. He said, the prince of this world comes and has nothing in me. Paul said he is the prince of the power of the air. And so there's no disputing as you look and see, you see all the tragedies in the world that there is an evil power that is rampaging around this planet. If it wasn't for God's grace intervening, nobody would survive. Question number five. What are some of the methods that Satan uses in his work of destruction? A, now we're going to go through a series of uh, points here. Point number A, it says in Revelation 12, verse 9, Satan, which deceiveth the whole world, he uses deception. Now, deception is especially sinister because it's the commingling of truth and error. See, God, you might say, is handicapped a little bit in this battle between good and evil because God can only use truth. God can't say, well, I'm going to use a little deception and fight fire with fire. Jesus never lied. Jesus never deceived. God only uses truth. But the devil can take a lot of truth and mix in a little poison and make it lethal. And that, that's what makes him so insidious. He's a deceiver. The Bible tells us in point B, it says he was in the wilderness for 40 days, Jesus, tempted of Satan. The devil is called the tempter. Now, why does the devil want us to sin? Why does he tempt people to sin? Well, first and foremost, he hates Jesus. If you have any doubt about how the devil feels about Jesus, all you have to do is look at the cross and you can see the devil's incredible love of power and God's incredible power of love there at the cross. And all the torturing and the suffering that Christ went through is a demonstration of how much the devil hates Jesus. Christ's whole earthly life, the devil tried to destroy him. It was only through angelic protection that Jesus survived until he was 33 and a half years of age. But in the Garden of Gethsemane, when Jesus prayed the third time and said, not my will, thy will be done, God withdrew his protection. And the devil then took him and put him through just terrible suffering and ultimately death. And that's what the devil wanted. He wanted to keep Jesus in the grave. He wanted to be God. And there's further proof of this, but he was a tempter. And you can look at the examples where he tempted Jesus. Christ faced all of the best of the devil's temptations after he had been in the wilderness fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. And we'll look at one example here in Matthew 4, verse 8. Finally, he takes him up on an exceedingly high mountain. This was the third temptation. And he showed him all the kings of the world and all their glory. He did not show him the slums. He didn't show him the pain and the misery. He showed him what it looked like in its glory. It, it is very best. And then he said that if you fall down and worship me, I'll give all of that to you. Which, of course, uh, he, he was just trying to uh, get his support. Now, can the devil perform miracles? Yeah. You can see in uh, answer number C here. It says, they are the spirits of devils working miracles. In Revelation 16, verse 14, some of you remember when uh, Moses was there before the Pharaoh. And uh, Pharaoh wanted a sign that Moses, God, was a real God. He threw down his rod, sometimes called the rod of Aaron, and it turned into a serpent. And then the Pharaoh clapped his hands and his magicians came out and they threw down their staffs and they became serpents. But Moses' staff ate their staffs and then they had nothing to stand on after that happened. It says he does great wonders so that he makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. Now, I don't, you know, I always am reluctant to say much to look like I'm giving the devil credit, but you need to be aware of your enemy. That's why we dedicate this time to talking about it. We are going to talk about in this seminar what the Bible talks about. I think you see we're giving you a lot of scripture. When the devil took Jesus up onto that high mountain, he obviously has some power. He's got the power to transport him. And then it says he showed them all the kingdoms in all of their glory. He's got the power of illusion. Uh, he had DVDs and video a long time before man invented it. And he showed Jesus this beautiful picture of uh, what it looked like and all the beautiful kingdoms. And he's basically saying, Jesus, you don't have to die for the world. You're here to redeem the world. 
I'm the prince of this world. I'll make a deal. I'll give it to you. Just this fine print, one little thing. All you've got to do is bow down and worship me. Acknowledge me as your Lord, and I'll give it to you. And Jesus met that temptation with the word of God. He said, it is written, you shall worship the Lord God only in him shall you serve. And ultimately he said, get thee behind me, Satan. But the devil has power. Now we need to know that because in the last days, Satan is going to impersonate Christ. And it says that the demons are going to be working miracles, even going so far as bringing fire down from heaven. That was often something in the Bible God did to show his approval as he did during the dedication of the tabernacle in the wilderness. And he did it for David. He did it for Elijah. He did it for Solomon. Fire of God came down. The devil's going to counterfeit that miracle in the last days. We must know what the Bible says. Jesus met these temptations with, it is written. Can't overemphasize that. In fact, I'm going to mention it again later. But so many people in the world, they think, well, I'm not going to serve the devil and I'm not going to serve God. I'm just going to live my own life. Jesus said, if you're not with me, then what's the only other alternative? You're against me. And if we do not have the Lord protecting us and guiding us, then we are puppets of the devil, friends. It's just the plain truth. You may not believe it, you may not think it, but it is a fact. And if you don't think so, then you're disagreeing with the words of Jesus. He said, unless you are with me, then you are against me. It means you're with the enemy. And uh, you don't want to think about what the ramifications of that are, but the devil... His end is not going to be good. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. The devil is always cynical, and he's always talking about others. He's always gossiping. He's always undermining. He's trying to accuse others because he's insecure. You know, probably people like that. They're always gossiping about other people, and the reason they do it is they're feeling like they're not getting enough attention. When Mary was washing Jesus' feet at that feast in Simon's house, Judas started to whisper to the other apostles, well, what a waste of money. That could have been sold and given to the poor. And he was doing the work of accusing there. In the book of Job, the devil saying, the only reason Job serves you is because you protect him. You read the prophecy of Zechariah. There the devil is accusing the high priest because of his dirty garments. He always stands as the accuser of the brethren. We've got to pray that God makes sure we're not of that spirit of gossiping and undermining and accusing others. D, he was a murderer from the beginning, for he's a liar and the father of it. He's the one who inspired Cain to murder his own brother. And, uh, of course, you see what he did to Jesus on the cross. He is absolutely heartless. That's why he's compared to a serpent in the Bible, is because he has no natural affection. Question six, when is the devil the most dangerous. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. That's right, the devil can, he can look like he's spiritual. I mean, after all, he wants us to worship in the last days. The beast is going to say, I want everybody to worship, but I want you to worship the way I'm telling you. Keep in mind, Cain worshiped God and then he killed his brother. The people who crucified Jesus went home to keep the Passover and worship. And so there's been a lot of murder that has been done in the name of the Lord because the devil and his representatives masquerade as angels of light. And I think we know in the world today there are a lot of wolves in sheep's clothing. Jesus said in Matthew 7, 15, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Paul said, I know that after my departure, grievous wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And so uh, he's warned us. Jesus said in the last days there will be false Christs and false prophets. And uh, there are some good ministers out there on radio and television. And I scan the airwaves and I hear some good points. And I know that a lot of them out there love the Lord. And every now and then we all know that there are some real bamboozlers out there that are robbing people in the name of the Lord. They are misleading people and they're doing it for their own glory like the devil. There are some wolves out there in sheep's clothing. Jesus warned us that that's when the devil is the most effective. Not when he's trying to attack the church from the outside, but when he sneaks in like Judas from the inside is when he does the most damage. You know, I did an amazing fact. Amazing facts, by the way, you might wonder where we get our name. 
started about 55 years ago with a radio program that begins with an amazing fact from science, nature, or history. And I was doing one for the radio program, and, and I encountered this incredible fact. Uh, probably the most deadly serial arsonist in history was John Orr. And they believe that he set 2,000 fires in which several people died in the Los Angeles area. What made it an especially bizarre story is he was an arson investigator, and he was a fire chief, and he trained other arson investigators, and he was out there setting fires. And so it, it just goes to show you how sometimes people can come off so trusting, and, so, and they can be, end up being the most dangerous. Does Satan know the Bible? Some people think, I don't need to worry about the devil. I own the Bible. And a matter of fact, I sleep with the Bible right next to my bed there. It's in the nightstand, and so I must be safe because I own a Bible. Uh, people think that the Bible is a good luck charm. It's like when I was a kid, I watched too much television. And in the vampire movies, if the vampire got too close, you held up garlic or a cross, and he would run away. Garlic still works for most people. But anyway, the, uh, and, and uh, people think that the Bible is a good luck charm. Ah, the devil will take the Bible out of your hands and he will quote it back to you and he knows it better than you do. In fact, you can read in the Bible that Jesus quoted the Bible to Jesus. I'm sorry, the devil quoted the Bible to Jesus. Matthew chapter 4, verse 5 and 6. Then the devil said to him, If you be the Son of God, cast yourself down, for it is written. How many times does the devil say, It is written, it is written. It is written, he'll give his angels charge concerning thee. And he leaves out part of that verse from Psalm 91. He not only quotes it, he knows how to misquote it. And he knows how to patch different scriptures together to mix people up. Whom on earth does the devil hate the most? That says the dragon, that's another name for the devil, was wroth with the woman. And he went to make war with the remnant of her seed. Now this woman, I'll tell you now, and we'll be repeating this later. There are two women in Revelation. In Revelation 12, you've got God's church. The beginning of Revelation 12, it talks about the dragon who is wanting to devour the man-child this woman is about to bring forth. And that woman is God's church who's going to bring forth the Messiah, the people of Israel, bring forth the Messiah to the world and introduce him. And uh, it's a symbol for the bride of Christ. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loves the church. There's another woman in Revelation 17, she represents the counterfeit church. She's called a harlot. She is unfaithful. And so you've got these two contrasting women. The very fact we know that the woman in Revelation 12 is God's church is because the devil wants to destroy her. It says he goes to persecute the woman, and he makes war against the woman. And two characteristics, keeps the commandments of God and has the testimony of Jesus. And so uh, the devil hates God's people. You know, why does the devil persecute humans? The uh, Bible tells us in Hebrews that angels are stronger than humans. Um, they're superior in strength. We're made lower than the angels. The devil's much more powerful than we are. Why does he even mess with humans? Because he hates Jesus. And he knows the best way to hurt Jesus is by hurting us. If you want to hurt a parent, uh, torturing them, yes, that'll hurt. But if you can't get to them, but you get to their children, that's when it really hurts. And during the dark ages, when a lot of the martyrs were tortured, they were willing to endure all kinds of torture. And when they did not give up their faith, then sometimes the inquisitors would bring their children in and say, now we're going to torture your children. And they couldn't take it. And that was one of the cruelest things that could be done. Well, the devil hates people because he hates Jesus. He wants to hurt us. The dragon has gone after the remnant of her seed. Going after, that means the descendants. What two deadly animals does the Bible use to portray Satan? Well, there's several actually in the Bible. Uh, sometimes a scorpion. But two of the most popular are, it says, be sober. This is 1 Peter 5, 8. Be sober, be vigilant, <laughs> be awake. Because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walks about seeking whom he might devour. A couple of years ago, uh, Pastor Ross, who's from South Africa, uh, his family and Mrs. Batchelor and I, we went to South Africa and we went to visit a lion park and was, we saw these white lions uh, ferociously eating the, the food that was thrown from the truck 
and uh, we've probably all seen nature footage. I just wanted to throw this story in so I could tell you that Mrs. Bachelor was attacked by a lion. She was, and she survived. I was right there. I didn't help her very much. Lion was only about that big, but yes, she, <laughs> she was attacked by a little lion cub. But uh, lions, they, they use deception to get their prey. And uh, the, the male lion, he doesn't do a lot of the hunting. He'll go and he'll roar, and the gazelle or the zebra and impala, they'll see the male, and they take off the other direction where the females are waiting in the grass. And the devil uses deception. The devil can see in the dark. He's a, a, like a lion. They're, they're, uh, they work best in the dark, you should say. And the other creature is the serpent. And that great dragon was cast out, that serpent called the devil and Satan. Why is he sometimes called the serpent? Well, the first medium that the devil used to tempt Eve there at the tree, he spoke through the serpent. And that just tells you something about the devil's ability and some of his powers. God spoke through a donkey <laughs> in the story of Balaam. The devil spoke through a serpent. And uh, snakes are cold-blooded. And uh, you know, sometimes they'll even devour their young. Uh, snakes, they can seem like they're dead, and then they attack you. You know, the devil is a defeated serpent. When Jesus died on the cross, uh, he dealt the devil a mortal blow, but he's still alive. Now, I've killed a lot of rattlesnakes. I used to live up in the desert, and even by our, our uh, cabin in the hills in Northern California, rattlesnakes are fairly common. And I don't bother them unless I see them anywhere near a trail or the road, because you don't want your animals or anything to get bit. But uh, I know that once you kill a snake, don't reach down and grab it because their nervous reflexes are so powerful that even after they've been mortally wounded, they'll snap around and bite you even though you think they're dead. That's why you pick up a snake when you've killed it and you carry it off with a stick. Don't let it get anywhere near you. And then you bury it so no other animal will step on its skull and be infected uh, even later. And that's why the Bible tells us that as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, on a pole. Maybe you know the story. The book of Numbers, children of Israel were complaining about their food. They did not like the manna, manna, manna every day. And the God withdrew his protection in a plague of venomous serpents, fiery red serpents. They weren't like the uh, golden lance head. Went through their camp, biting them, and many were dying from the snake bites. And they came to Moses and said, save us. We're sorry about complaining about the food that God was giving us and God told Moses to make a bronze serpent and lift it up on a pole and tell whoever looks at this serpent on a pole will be forgiven. They'll be healed from the venom of the serpent. And when they looked, they lived. That serpent on a pole, later Jesus tells us, is a sign of him on the cross. Christ dying on the cross provided the antidote. It was the guarantee that the serpent would be destroyed. He took sin in himself and he uh, suffered for the penalty of our sins that we might be forgiven. The Bible tells us that through Christ, you will tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent. You will trample underfoot. And I hope everyone knows that's a symbol. There are some churches that think that means you're supposed to collect snakes and stomp on them. But uh, this is just saying in our battle with the devil that because of faith in Christ, we can resist temptation and we can be victorious. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. He told Eve, God's trying to keep something from you. If you eat that forbidden fruit, you will be like God, which is what the devil wanted. He wanted to have God's power. And you know, so many false religions basically tell you the same thing today. You can be like God. Just uh, listen to the devil and you'll have special powers. He offers them that. The serpent said to the woman, you'll not really die. You know why there's sin in the world? Because people complained about God's manna. They did not believe the Bible. God said, do not eat it, you will die. The devil said, you will not die. Everybody has to decide, do we believe the word of God or do we not believe it? The reason there's so much pain and misery and evil and wickedness in the world today is because the human family said, I don't think we need to really believe the word of God. And look where that's got us. Eve doubted, and then Adam doubted, and then it spread. That fruit was uh, deadly. You know, I was uh, doing Amazing Facts again. I ran into an interesting fact about the mancanel tree. 
that grows around the Caribbean. And some people see it. It grows on the bushes there by the mangroves, and it looks like an apple. And they say, oh, I wonder if that's edible. You know, sometimes people will take a piece of wild fruit. They take a bite of it, wondering, big mistake. This fruit is probably, it's not a tree of life. It's a tree of death. It is so poisonous that it could easily kill you cause blistering in the mouth and cause kidney problems and your, your throat tightens up and uh, I think it's probably uh, one of the deadliest things. God said, do not eat that forbidden fruit. Doubting God's word is a dangerous. Just look at all the suffering in the world today. And when we think, if God is a God of love, why does he allow this? God is the one who is the saddest about the war and the pain and the poverty and the suffering in the world. It grieves him much more. But you see, God, he allows the world to make choices. And instead of saying, why do all these bad things happen? We really should be saying, if the penalty for sin is death, why do so many good things happen? Why is God still blessing the world with so many beautiful things? And sometimes we have uh, great spells of joy in our lives. God is a loving God and he is invading the devil's territory to try and bring us hope and salvation. But... Uh, the plan of salvation has to play out until everyone has made that decision. What's the only way that we can resist Satan? Answer, James 4, 7. Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Amen. It goes on to say, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. If you how do you draw near to God? Well, you pray. He, he's there all the time. Talk to him. I talked to him driving up to the program. I went upstairs before the program and knelt down. I, I prayed. I talked to God. Uh, Peter prayed when he was swimming. You can talk to God all the time. Jesus said, I'll never leave you and forsake you. He's nearby. How did Jesus fight the assaults of the devil? We've talked about this, but I want to uh, just hammer this home. He said unto him, get thee hence, Satan, for it is written. All three temptations, Jesus said, it is written, it is written, it is written. The sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. This is the rock that David used to kill Goliath. And then after he hit Goliath in the forehead, he chopped off his head with a sword. It's the sword of God's spirit, which is the word of God. Hebrews 4 tells us the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. And so if we hide God's word in our heart, Psalms 119 tells us it, it's there to keep us from sin. Store up the word in your mind and in your heart. When and where will the devil receive his punishment and what will that punishment be? That through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil. Through Christ's death he was able to destroy Satan who has the power of death. And Jesus tells us in the parable there in Matthew 25, 41, ultimately all the lost, the devil and his angels and all that follow them, will have their end in the lake of fire. Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Isaiah 14, 15, it says, You will be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. And the Bible tells us that Satan is going to be cast into that lake of fire there in Revelation chapter 20. Will Satan never reappear to tempt God's people again? Now, after the devil is destroyed and after the Lord comes to catch us up and and we go to the mansions that he's prepared. Uh, when he makes a world new, do we have to worry that, well, how do we know this won't happen again? The universe will not again be contaminated with this problem of sin and another evil power. You can read in the book of Ezekiel 19, or 28, 19, never shall thou be anymore. Satan is never going to be a problem again. Uh, it may be that Gabriel ended up taking uh, Lucifer's place as God's premier angel. It seems that way. It says in the book of Nahum, chapter 1, verse 9, affliction, sin, will not rise up again the second time. We will never have to worry. Whenever we're in heaven and we look at the scars in Jesus' hands, we're going to know what the cost of sin was. We won't want to repeat that mistake. Number 14, how does God feel about the destruction of the wicked? It breaks his heart. Ezekiel 33, 11, Say unto them, as I live, says the Lord, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. What God wants is for the wicked to turn from his way and to live. 
And he pleads, turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways, for why will you die? Jesus began by saying, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. We must be sorry for our sins and say, Lord, change my heart. Give me the power to be a new creature. And you can go through that new birth. So the things you once loved, you will hate, and the things you once hated, you'll love. You can be a new creature and have real joy and have the gift of everlasting life. You know, uh, I read a story years ago that in the um, Crystal River in 1986 in Florida, a mother was horrified when she heard a neighbor scream. She ran outside, and there was a, a large lake near their home. And she said, an alligator just bit your son, attacked your son, Michael. And what had happened, the boy was out there snorkeling. The alligator, 11 feet long, bit down on his head. And because he had the mask and the snorkel on, his first bite, he was able to slip out of that grip. And when the boy was underwater, he looked up, he saw the belly of the alligator, and he knew what it was. He was 12 years old, and he began to swim underwater as far as he could, and then he went above water. And the mother ran outside, and they saw him swimming towards shore, and they saw the alligator finally realize where he was and started coming after him. The mother ran down to the edge of the water. She went off into the water, and it was kind of rocky ground. And the boy started clambering up on the bank at the same time the alligator got to him got a hold of his left leg, she got a hold of his hands, and there on the banks there was a tug of war between this cold-blooded reptile and the mother over the boy. And he's screaming, don't let go. And the alligator is trying to pull him down in the water where they can begin what they call their death roll. And when they start spinning like that, it just will whip something out of your hands. But the mother's love and pull was stronger, and she yanked the boy out of the alligator's mouth. Later, it was shot. Uh, they found the alligator. They actually shot two gators, and they're pretty sure it was the bigger of the two. And a few weeks later, the boy had some cuts on his scalp, and uh, one leg was actually broken uh, by the alligator. And someone interviewed him and, and uh, said, uh, you know, what was that like? And, and he told him, and, and he said, do you mind if I take a look at your leg? And he pulled off the sheets and showed him the scars on his leg that healed up eventually. And the boy very proudly said, and I've got scars on my hands also where his mother's nails dug in because she would not let go. And, you know, there's somebody who has scars on their hands because they would not let go of you. Jesus is desperate to save you, friends. You just need to trust him and give your heart to him. The Bible promises he that is in you is greater than he that is in the world. There is a battle in this world between good and evil. And I can tell you now, I know which side ends. It's in the book of Revelation. Jesus wins. And you want to be in his hands if you want that eternal life that he's offering and a better life now. He says, I've come to give you an abundant life. Christ said to Nicodemus there in John 3, 14. We all know John 3, 16. Look at John 3, 14 and 15. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Friends, Jesus wants you to have that everlasting life. You need to just come to him where you are, wherever you're listening right now. You might be watching online or one of the satellite channels, and God is speaking to your heart. He wants to give you that gift. You simply need to ask him. Say, Lord, will you please come into my heart? I believe that Jesus is your son, that you came into the world to show us what God is like, to be our example, and to die as our sacrifice for all the sins we've ever committed, that we might be forgiven and given a new heart, become new creatures, and have a place in your kingdom. Don't worry about how it's going to happen. Just come to him, and he will adopt you as his child. And the Bible promises, whoever comes to me, I will not lose. He will not let go of you, friends. Will you do that now? We'd like to pray together. And don't go away, though, because we're going to come back with Bible questions in just a moment. Father in heaven, we're so thankful that even though there's an evil power rampaging in this, in this world, we also see abundant evidence that you are more powerful, that you are good, that there are more good angels than bad angels to protect us, and that we can give our lives into your hands, and you'll guard us, you'll set a hedge about us. You promise that the angel of the Lord encamps round about those that fear you, Lord. I pray that you'll bless each person watching. May they surrender their hearts and their lives to you, 
and trust you to provide the anti-venom for sin through the blood of your son. We ask this now in Jesus' name. Amen. Don't go away, friends. We'll be right back and send in your Bible questions. What if you could know the future? What would you do? What would you change? To see the future, you must understand the past. Alexander the Great becomes king when he's only 18, but he's a military prodigy. 150 years in advance, Cyrus had been named. Rome was violent, they were ruthless, they were determined. This intriguing documentary, hosted by Pastor Doug Batchelor, explores the most striking Bible prophecies that have been dramatically fulfilled throughout history, kingdoms in time. Are you ready? Have you ever skipped a meal? Not a bad idea if you need to watch your waistline, but there's a heavenly food you should never skip, God's Word. Yet, how can you dive in daily when you're so busy? Amazing Facts has you covered, and it's as easy as signing up for our daily devotional and verse of the day, both sent directly to your inbox, ready to bless, inspire, and inform you. To start receiving the Amazing Facts daily devotional and verse of the day, visit AmazingFacts.org and click on Bible Study in the main menu. You'll be glad you did. Amazing Facts offers some of the best Christian resources for all ages. We hope our products will enrich your life and your walk with the Lord. Death, a subject everyone thinks about, but no one enjoys talking about. Is there life after death? The Afterlife Mystery is a brand new sharing magazine that answers all your questions. Get yours today by calling 800-538-7275 or visit afbookstore.com. Hello, friends. Welcome back to Revelation Now, and we're going to go to your questions that have come in. And we want to thank all of those who have sent in your questions across the country and from different countries. So, Pastor Doug, we have a great number of questions. Uh, let's go ahead and put up our first question for this evening, and we'll get right mm -hmm. to it. So the question that we have is, um, where did the idea come from that the devil has horns and a tail? You know, I'm, I'm not exactly sure, but I seem to remember that in Greek mythology that there's, you know, various creatures that they have that are sort of hybrids of human. And not only in Greek mythology, but in, uh, in a number of the pagan religions, you can see even on the ancient carvings, they've got sort of these half-human, half-goat creatures. Mm -hmm. that, you know, they've got horns, and they've got goat hooves, and they've got bat wings, and, and uh, some of the medieval pictures that I think have come out of paganism portray the devil that way. Of course, the devil probably likes the idea for us to think of him as this unreal, strange creature because, yeah. like you mentioned this evening, the devil is very real and he's a deceiver. He's and he knows think people. thinking people will not take that seriously mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. he wants that, where right. in reality he's a very brilliant, beautiful, intelligent creature. Okay. Uh, we're ready for our next question. The question is, how many angels joined Lucifer's rebellion in heaven? Well, the Bible tells us about a percentage. Uh, we don't know what that number is. We can speculate. Um, we know that uh, it says one-third of the angels were cast out, a third of the stars. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's pretty significant when you think about it, that the, the devil was so influential in his deception. He's persuaded most of the world to follow him, but he persuaded one-third of these holy angels to follow him. And... Uh, you know, now, of course, uh, they're destroyed. And in the world today, when we talk about the devil's angels, we don't call them the devil's angels. They're, they're demons, mm -hmm. evil spirits. Jesus talked about them. And often when Christ cast out evil spirits, you can tell there was a battle before because they knew who he was. And they say, oh, we know who you are, Jesus, Son of God. We remember you. We know you're incarnate now, but we know. Have you come to torment us before the time? They mm -hmm. also know their judgment's coming. Uh, Satan says in uh, Revelation 12, and I forget the verse, might be verse 9, where it says, he's woe to the inhabitants of the earth. He's come down having great, great wrath. wrath. He's know his time is short. He knows his time is short. The devil knows that. So uh, how many angels? 
Well, if everyone's got a guardian angel and there's 8 billion people in the world, probably billions of angels. You know, it's always an interesting thought. Uh, I actually preached on that this weekend about where Jesus cast out an evil spirit from someone. And the evil spirit said, I know who you are, the Holy One of God. It's interesting to think that the last time they probably met face to face, the angel was still in heaven, quite possibly worshiping before the throne. And now this evil angel meets Jesus on the earth. So, uh, I mean, they've been around for a long time. We don't know how long, but yeah. these evil angels have been around. Of course, mm -hmm. in heaven, they were beautiful, uh, loving beings until they followed Satan's deceptions. Mm. Uh, we have another question that's come in. It says, uh, God said to Adam and Eve, in the day that you eat thereof, you shall surely die. Genesis 2 verse 17. Why didn't they die that day? Well, in a sense, they did. Uh, as soon as they sinned, you know, something changed. Uh, first of all, the reason they didn't drop dead is God's mercy. And God had a plan activated to save them. The Bible talks about the lamb slain from the foundation of the mm -hmm. world. And when Adam and Eve left the garden, it says God gave them skins. They tried to cover themselves with fig leaves. But God said that's not adequate. I think it's also interesting. It says they made themselves aprons of leaves. That would be, you know, minimal material. And it says God gave them tunics mm -hmm. or robes of skin. Well, in order to have skin, something had to die. And we believe that's when the Lord established the sacrificial system. That's what Abel was following when God accepted his sacrifice. And they understood the plan of salvation, that God's son would come. And when John the Baptist pointed to Jesus and said, this is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, uh, that, that was the fulfillment of that. And what was the question again? Uh, <laughs> in the day you eat of Oh, why it didn't die? happen that day? So they died, yeah, they died uh, spiritually uh, right away. Their light went out. They saw their nakedness. And it is also interesting that when you live for eternity, uh, 2 Peter chapter 3 says, a day with the Lord is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is a day. Adam and Eve, no man has ever lived a thousand years, except Enoch, because he was translated. But uh, Adam lived 930 years and he died. So if, if a millennium is a day, in you know, thinking about before the fall, then he died in that first millennium. But I think he died spiritually. He began dying. And I think in the Hebrew it says, in dying you will die. Mm -hmm. Meaning the process of dying will begin the day that you yeah. sin. Okay, very good. We've got a question that's come in. It says, how do you know Christianity is the correct religion to practice? Well, the same reason that I know that the multiplication table is true is because it adds up. <laughs> uh, you know, the evidence is there that it works. And just uh, later in the week, I might be sharing more of my uh, personal testimony, but, um, you know, I tried a number of world religions and uh, it, they were all just really powerless. But when, when I finally turned to Jesus and Christianity, they, I couldn't find anything that made more sense where every, all the pieces fit together. It provides the answer. It gives you a scheme where all of a sudden you understand the, um, the purpose of life, you know, you can't be happy unless you really understand where you've come from, what you're doing here, and where you're going. And all those answers are given in the Bible in the Christian um, story, in the Christian mm -hmm. example of, of what uh, the purpose of life is. Okay. Another question that we have is, uh, are we supposed to worship the Holy Spirit? Well, in that we are to worship God only, we certainly worship in the Holy Spirit. But typically in the Bible, it tells us that the Holy Spirit is uh, encouraging us to worship the Father and the Son. In fact, you always see through the Bible, the f they're all trying to out-love and give and, and uh, adore each other. Jesus is always pointing to the Father. The Spirit is always pointing to Jesus and the Father. The Father is wanting to exalt the Son. And, um, but it, it, I'm trying to think. I can't think of an example where they were told to worship the Spirit. They always prayed in the Spirit mm -hmm. to the Son or to the Father in the name of the Son. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have another question that somebody's asking. This is, uh, let's see, we've got uh, somebody asking from, oh, they don't give us the place. I thought they did. But uh, can you explain uh, something about the resurrection? And then they mention a special resurrection. Did the Bible say anything about a special resurrection? Yeah, good question. And now keep in mind, friends, this is live right now at the time of recording. Pastor Ross is getting these questions hot from the Internet, <laughs> from you. And so you could be sending them in. Um, you know, the, the Bible has exceptions. 
The Bible tells us it's appointed unto man once to die and after that the judgment. Well, for most people, they must die and then there's a judgment. few exceptions. You've got Enoch who walked with God, we just referenced, and he's never died. You've got Elijah who went to heaven in a fiery chariot. He never died. Um, Moses was raised before the typical judgment, three days after his death. At the cross of Christ, you've got some people that were specially resurrected. It tells you in Matthew 28. And when Christ comes again, it appears that Jesus is going to raise a few people in advance. One group is going to be honored because they spent their lives proclaiming his coming. And the other group is going to be punished. He told Caiaphas, the high priest, hereafter you will see me mm -hmm. coming in the clouds of heaven. And the Bible says uh, those also who pierced him. I think it's in Revelation. Revelation 1, 7. Yeah. You know, every eye will see him. Those also who pierced him will see him when he comes. They're going to be raised to witness that. And then I think also, Pastor Doug, in uh, Daniel chapter 12, it speaks about that time Michael shall stand up and there'll be a time of trouble worse than the world has ever seen. Mm -hmm. And then it says there will be a resurrection, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. Yeah. So we get the idea that, yes, there will be a resurrection, that those who played a leading role in the crucifixion of Jesus, uh, they're resurrected to see Jesus come. Mm -hmm. and of course, they're not saved, but in response to their question, mm -hmm. they get to see Jesus yeah. coming. Uh, another question that we have is, uh, if we all have free will in heaven, how does God know that we won't sin again? Well, because I think the whole universe, uh, they're going to have a photographic memory through eternity. And, you know, the only thing, <laughs> sometimes in my quiet time, I, I play piano. And one of the songs I play is an old southern gospel song. And it says, uh, the only thing made by man in heaven will be the scars in Jesus' hands. Mm. And so, you know, he rose from the dead and he told Thomas, he said, look at my hands, look at my side. He still bears the scars. We're going to see the results. We'll remember vividly what a terrible thing happened in the experiment of sin. And that'll be an eternal guarantee that it'll never rise up again the second time. Mm -hmm. Somebody's asking here, what happened first, Satan's rebellion in heaven or the creation of the earth? Uh, we believe, you know, we did a study on that when we were producing the Cosmic Conflict DVD, and uh, we're pretty certain that the rebellion in heaven happened first before the world was created. Indeed, part of the reason that God created the world is he said to Adam and Eve, be fruitful and fill the earth. They weren't going to, you know, multiply indefinitely, or eventually, you know, people would be spilling off the planet like rabbits. But uh, he wanted to, to populate the world, and it created uh, beings, intelligent beings in God's image, to somewhat take the place, the vacuum created by those angels mm -hmm. that were cast out. So we think that the rebellion, then the creation. Okay. And I think it really bothered the devil that uh, he couldn't create. Right. Um, will we remember all of our days here on earth when we get to heaven? Well, yes and no. Um, I believe that when we are raised, you know, God isn't going to brainwash us so we don't know that... Uh, what we've been through and how God saved us. The Bible does tell us in Isaiah, and I'm trying to remember the verse where it says, the former will not be remembered or come into mind. Is that uh, Isaiah 11 or 65? He's talking about, for as the new heavens and the new earth that I will make. I think all the former painful memories, God is going to heal. And as the years of eternity roll, uh, the, the uh, joy and the glory and the bliss and the pleasures at his right hand forevermore are going to so far outweigh and eclipse any of the painful memories that they won't even come into mind. But it doesn't mean that God, we're going to forget what Jesus did to save us. I think we'll always know that. Okay. We have another question that somebody has sent in, Pastor Doug. I think it's a good one. The question is, if God is good, why does he allow innocent children to die? Yeah. You know, my brother was born with a, uh, uh, what ended up being a terminal disease. Mm -hmm. And uh, I used to always ask that question. Why was I? My brother used to ask that question too. He'd say, Doug, life isn't fair. He said, I'm smart and I'm sick and you're healthy and you're stupid. <laughs> and uh, he said, it just doesn't make any sense. Um, and I used to wonder, you know, what caused that? Well, there, there's sin in the world that has been caused by man. When men war against their fellow man, innocent people die. Mm -hmm. God does not always interrupt the results of terrible decisions that are made. The terrible decision made by Adam and Eve, we're suffering for that. When the children of Israel were made slaves in Egypt, it wasn't because of a decision they made to live in Egypt. 
It was a decision their ancestors made. And they were then suffering because of that. And so there is a cause and effect that God allows to play out. It's one of the laws of the universe that he allows. And he's going to ultimately rescue. So in heaven there will be no sickness or sorrow or pain or death. We got a lesson coming on that. So keep tuning in, friends. Keep coming this week. I think our first night off is Thursday. Mm -hmm. So we want you to keep coming. Okay, somebody's asking, Pastor Doug, what is Gog and Magog in Revelation? Very good. Another example of where Revelation is a composite of Old Testament stories. In Genesis chapter 10, you find the first reference to Gog and Magog. These were ancient enemies of God's people. And uh, they end up becoming... Now, keep in mind, Revelation... Every name in Revelation is a symbol. That sounds like an outrageous statement. I mean, there's once or twice where you see the word Jesus in Revelation, but he's often called the Lamb, the Amen... You know, he's the living waters, he's the door. He's got so many names in the Bible. Um, in the Bible, when it talks about Gog and Magog, that was an Old Testament name that identified sort of a composite of the enemies of God's people. Gog and Magog means from the matrix or those who have come out of Gog. So it's Gog and the children of Gog. It's like Babylon and her daughters warring against God's people. And okay. you find that in Revelation 11. Okay, another question that's coming, it says, uh, is the devil in charge of hell? Can I rewind just one sure. point? I forgot to mention in Ezekiel 38, it also talks about Gog and Magog covering the earth like a cloud to fight against God's people. And then God mm -hmm. fights for his people, which is what you see also in Revelation 20. Okay. Sorry, now back to that. Yeah, the question is, is the devil in charge of hell? No. There's nothing in the Bible that tells us. Some people think because... Um, they say that you know, the devil talks about being in Sheol. Sheol was a word that meant the grave. Mm. Uh, there, <laughs> I, I remember years ago, I'll confess, I almost never buy them. I think once or twice just for Bible prophecy presentations, I bought tabloid magazines because the prophecies on the cover were so outrageous. I said, I got to get this and take a picture of it. But I remember reading one tabloid that said, well drillers in Russia drill into hell and they hear the demons shrieking. <laughs> and uh, people think that way down yonder there, there, there's a big burning cavern. And they used to know, see, there was a, a, uh, there was a Greek god, Vulcan, the god of fire. They'd see these volcanoes, that's where we get the word, where the hot plasma would come out from down below. And they thought, well, if God's going to burn people, it must be down on the earth where there's this burning going on. And Satan, that's his dwelling place. And they commingled the teaching about Vulcan, the god of fire with the devil, got the idea that the Bible devil is in charge of hell. doesn't say that anywhere in the Bible. Who could trust him to decide how people are punished? Right. <laughs> okay, the question we have now is, uh, why do the books of Daniel and Revelation use so many symbols? Why doesn't God just tell us the future plainly? Great question. Uh, there are uh, four apocalyptic books that use a lot of this vivid imagery in the Bible. There may be more. Let me see. There's Revelation, Daniel, Ezekiel, Zechariah, they often have visions with uh, a lot of, I think uh, Hosea has some too. They have these visions with images. Usually when that happens, they're being occupied by another country. For example, Daniel in his visions, he talks about the fall of Babylon, the fall of Persia, to protect those writings from being destroyed by the government as tre treasonous. God would give them these messages in symbolic languages. When John wrote Revelation, he was imprisoned by Rome. But in there, he talks about the fall of Rome. And so to protect these messages and also to give the truth to those that search. Jesus said, seek and you'll find. He gives us the keys in the Bible for what the symbols mean. He put it all in this uh, prophetic, symbolic language. And I think right there in the first chapter of Revelation, it says that he sent his angel to signify it. Mm -hmm. And that word signify means to signify. It means exactly that. He sent this message in a series of signs. And the book of Revelation, God uses symbolic language to tell very real truths about prophecy and salvation. Okay, this person is asking, why didn't God end the sin problem right after the flood? All the sinners were drowned. Why didn't he start the new earth then? Well, first of all, Jesus hadn't come. All right. And so uh, we would have been up a creek without a paddle, pardon the pun, <laughs> <laughs> in the ark. Uh, but uh, when... Uh, 
also, you know, the whole plan of salvation, God is allowing things to reach maturity. And, and I know we're thinking, man, this problem with sin, this terrible experiment is going on for 6,000 years. It seems so long and our lives compared to eternity are so short. I mean, compared to eternity, how long is 6,000 years? Mm -hmm. You can't even see it. It's nothing. And so the time that God is taking in the scope of history to demonstrate the, the danger of evil and the danger of selfishness, the devil revealed to the universe what would happen if someone lived by selfishness instead of love. And it's a very vivid uh, demonstration that he had to allow to play out. Mm -hmm. Um, this person is asking, uh, actually Rachel asks, does Satan know any of our thoughts or just hear us when we speak? In, I believe it's in, you can look it up and check for me, Pastor Ross, in 2 Kings, or maybe it's 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 39, Solomon is praying and he says, God and God only knows the thoughts of men's hearts. And then I believe in Mark chapter 2, Jesus knew what they were thinking and he answered what they were thinking. And then at Simon's feast, Jesus knew what he was thinking. Only God knows what's happening in our gray matter with the thoughts that are snapping around in our heads. Uh, the devil can tempt you, and he can look at your expression, and he can study your character, and he can sort of know what you're thinking. Sometimes you're married to someone long enough, and I can know what they're thinking. They have certain patterns that you observe, and... Uh, you know, you can just look at the external evidence and kind of know what's going on on the inside. And so the devil can do that very well. And keep in mind, when we say the devil knows what we're thinking, he doesn't really know. He's operating through your, his uh, demons. And the same way God has appointed guardian angels to guard and to save us, I think the devil has got fallen angels that study our weaknesses. And it's something like uh, C.S. Lewis probably said in his book, The Screw Tape Letters, where... Demons are assigned to specialize in a person and know their weaknesses. So they can tempt us and know if they're getting through by external evidence, but they cannot read your minds. Mm -hmm. Now, some people say, well, because the devil doesn't know what you're thinking, should you always pray quietly to yourself? No, the devil trembles when we pray. Jesus prayed out loud. That's why the prayers are recorded in the Bible. So it's okay to pray out loud as well as pray in your heart. Okay, the next question that we have, by the way, past, uh, past the, the verse you're referring to Mark chapter 2 where Jesus says, knowing what they were reasoning in their hearts. Why do you reason about these things in your heart? So yes, that's right. That's and what was that one verse? Of the verses. That's uh, Mark chapter 2, verse 8. Verse 8. Okay, thank you. And that's referring to, of course, it's one of the identifying marks that Jesus is divine. He knows. Because God thoughts. only knows. That's, that's right. right. All right, we have another question that's come in, and it, uh, it says, in Genesis, it speaks about angels having children with humans. Is that correct? No. And I may as well just deal with it head on, friends. In Genesis chapter 6, it says, As men began to multiply on the earth, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair and took them wives of all they chose. And then they have this offspring together, and it says they were giants. People say, well, these sons of God, it's one place in the Bible it calls angels sons of God. And so they're assuming that these fallen angels had intimate relations with humans. Now, there's all kinds of biological problems with trying to play that out. Uh, and that somehow they were able to produce these half-human, half-demon creatures. It's not at all what it means. The Bible says in John, 1 John chapter 3, verse 1, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called sons of God. And several times in the Bible it says we are the sons of God. And we are sons and daughters of God. The children of Seth, Remember, Abel was killed. Adam and Eve had another son. His name was Seth. He loved the Lord. He was faithful. He was like Adam. Cain left, and he built a city called Enoch. And they stayed completely separate. I mean, he had killed his brother. He was sort of an outcast from his family. Cain took one of his sisters, started to procreate, and they a whole new population was born. Remember, they lived hundreds of years, and you can have a lot of kids if you live a long time like that. And then the children of Seth and Adam and Eve, they all stayed separate. And the children of Cain, they turned their back on God. They were called mm -hmm. the children of men. But the ones who trusted and still sacrificed to God by the gates of the Garden of Eden, they were called the sons of God. And, but the sons of God started, started visiting the daughters of men. They said, well, they're beautiful. 
and they begin to intermarry the believers with the unbelievers. And this is what God told the children of Israel. Do not intermarry with the pagans. You will lose your faith. And after they began to intermarry, they started losing their faith in God. And that's when it said wickedness filled the earth. Some people are going, but why does it say the offspring were giants? That is a very common genetic fact. It's called genetic vitality. That when people are not breeding in the same family and you get genetic strength. When if you have just people breeding within the same clan on the same island for too long, there's all kinds of genetic problems and weaknesses. So they were taller and stronger. And uh, I hear if you cross a tiger with a lion, you get a liger. And a liger will be taller than a lion and a tiger. Mm -hmm. And a donkey and a horse make a mule that can be bigger than either. And if you do a zebra and a donkey, you get a... Zonkey. A zonkey. I thought you'd know that because <laughs> you're from South Africa, which is going to be bigger than a donkey. Anyway, so that's just genetic vitality. Okay, very good. Here's a good question. How can you tell whether it's God speaking to you or the devil? Yeah, and I think we've all sometimes gotten confused at times. And, um, well, first of all, you'll know by the word of God. Mm -hmm. uh, man should live by every word that proceeds from people say, well, I feel this. Well, if your feelings go against the word of God, that might be the devil giving you a feeling. Uh, some people say, well, I feel the spirit is telling me. Well, the devil's got a spirit too. And some people have been deceived by evil spirits that they confuse for a warm feeling coming from the devil. And uh, so you, principally you go by the word of God. I do believe the spirit guides, but it will be in harmony with the word of God. And sometimes if you're in doubt, get good Christian counsel. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, they'll point you to the word of God and that, that will also guide you. You know, Pastor Doug, I'm just reminded, we do have a book at the Amazing Facts website called Determining the Will of God. And it's free. Folks can just go and take a look. Uh, go to the Amazing Facts website, click on the free library, and you can actually read the book Determining the Will of God. Yeah. Again, we'd like to remind you, we do have a free offer. It's one of our Amazing Facts study guides. And it's got the same title as tonight's presentation, Did God Create the Devil? And if you'd like to receive this, all you have to do is text the word devil to the number 40544, and we will send you a digital copy of this great study guide. Uh, you can also, if you'd like, go to the Revelation Now website. Just click on the free resources, and you'll be able to download uh, the lesson. Now, Pastor Doug, we've got another meeting tomorrow evening. Yes, we're going to be talking about the uh, ultimate sacrifice. And so our friends do not want to miss tomorrow night. It's probably one of the most important presentations. Mm -hmm. You know, people come to a Revelation seminar like this and they want to know about, you know, the Antichrist and they want to know about the beast and the rapture and Armageddon and some of these, these hot button issues and angels. But Revelation is really about salvation. So we're going to be talking about the gospel in the book of Revelation and how important it is to understand that truth because that ultimately is how we're saved. And it's not too late for our friends to invite their friends. We're still, this program is going to be going on. We've got, in case you're wondering, there are 17 more presentations. Revelation's got uh, 22 chapters. We're not going to be able to cover everyone, but we're going to cover a lot. So friends, you want to keep on going or keep on coming? Invite your friends to go to Revelation now and they can still register. It may make an eternal difference for them.